me. Good morning. All right. I just want to say thank you so much for gathering on this day in this place. Um, this is a wonderful day, not only for Bay Path University. Bay Path, can we give a little shout out? Bay Path, yes. And also, how about for downtown Springfield? Yes. And the Springfield Museums. Give them a round of applause. Yes, give them a round of applause because we are sitting in this space. And a, a very much thanks to Dr. Leary who uh, making this possible um, with her husband, Noel, and for the whole Springfield Museums community. And I'd like to bring forth Kay Simpson, the president of Springfield Museums. Well, good morning. Welcome again to the Springfield Museums. As Janine said, my name is Kay Simpson. I am the president of the Springfield Museums. And we are really excited to be hosting this breakfast in the Wood Museum of Springfield History. The Wood Museum just presented its 10th anniversary celebration this past weekend. And it's just so hard to believe that 10 years have gone by. If you've not had an opportunity to see the exhibitions in this museum, they showcase the history and innovation of industry in Springfield and the proud legacy of all the city's many accomplishments. So I think some of you are new to the museum and I believe you're gonna have time to go and see the exhibits after today's program and I welcome you to do so. Given that the Wood Museum of Springfield history honors the city's past, we thought it would be the perfect setting for today's event. We feel privileged to be the setting for a program that pays tribute to Dr. Carol Leary, freedom writer Jean Denton Thompson, and the other women who have made such important contributions to the history of Western Massachusetts and indeed America. It is fitting that Joe Carvalho and Wayne Fanup are here to launch the walking trail of women's history and that elected officials are joining us as well. We believe the Quadrangle Museums play an important role in the city of Springfield. We are located, as you know, in the heart of the downtown with five museums and the outdoor Dr. Seuss National Memorial Sculpture Garden. Our museums have a deep history in the city of Springfield. We were established more than 160 years ago. However, in order to stay relevant to today's audiences, we continue to change and evolve. So we are always looking to welcome new audiences and that's one of the reasons we are so pleased that there are so many students and faculty members from Bay Path here today to experience what we have to offer. Now, I'm going to turn the podium back to Janine Fondant. Um, Janine has been the architect for this wonderful event. Please give her a round of applause for everything she is doing. And I want to say, first of all, all the faculty in the room, can you raise your hands, give them a round of applause and staff. Um, and it is through the inspiration of all of the faculty, all of the faculty and community members who are here. Community members, raise your hands because that we all become a students of advancing women and making sure we know our history. And as we think about the history, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the walking trail down the pike here, um, but the, the walking trail, and actually it's a bus tour for many of us who can't walk as far as we once thought we could. Um, but it starts off with Washagan, which is a native woman in Wilbraham. I know when we start our history, we always you know, think about pension. But I started off this wonderful history with Washagan, who lived on Wigwam Hill in Wilbraham, a native woman who said, I am staying here. So with this inspiration, I bring forth um, Gentle Running Deer and her great-granddaughter, niece, who is, will give us the native blessing from their culture. Thank you. 
Motampin Wani, which means good morning. I will be reading or saying the Nitma prayer in the native language, and my great niece here, April, will be letting you know what I'm saying in English. Manitou, Manitou, Wami, Masoganak, Manitou. Great Spirit, Great Spirit, Almighty Great Spirit. Kinuta, Nanipo, Nanakwibian, Manitou. Hear me, I stand before you, Great Spirit. Tabatni, Kurbaramus, Nuwachi, Iokisakak, Wanigan. Thank you, I thank you for this beautiful day. Kurbaramus, Nuwachi, Wanenomiyonk. I thank you for my good health. Nopiantam Asakisakokis Nuwachi Wami Nenaminaswak. I pray every day for all my people. Nopiantam Nuwachi Paumawak Nisausak Tashi Pomentawak. I pray for the future seven generations. Nopiantam Nuwachi Nishno Owas Pomantak. I pray for all the living creatures. Nopiantam Nuwachi. And Kisakwa Nishno Motampin. I pray to the sun every morning. Ninawan Tabatentumwak Nuwachi Kapunumwak Wani. We give thanks for the good harvest. Ninawan Tabatantumwak Nuwachi Tuamukak Wanigan. We give thanks for the beautiful forest. Ninawan Tabotumwak Nuwachi Wami Metagwash Ka. We give thanks for all the beautiful trees and flowers surrounding us. We give thanks for all the beautiful lakes and waterfalls. We give thanks for all good things. Aho. Aho. Have Zoe Naglieri Prescott, one of our students, and thank you for that wonderful blessing. Thank you. Morning, everybody. I am Zoe Naglieri Prescott, and I am the vice president of the Communications Club at Bay Path, as well as the lead editor of the student run magazine Network News on campus. I'm here today on behalf of the Bay Path University undergraduate communications classes and I just wanted to let you all know that students will be walking around taking photos and this event will be filmed by Longmeadow TV. We hope that you have a great time, that you learn something new, and that you feel empowered going on through your day. Thank you. And I just want to add onto that, thank you so much, Zoe. This is, was really an event that was held on the Bay Path campus for our students, and we thought it was important that our students be right in the middle of the community to share their voices and to be brave, enter their brave space, so they can also share their voices and feelings. And can we just give them a round of applause to all the students who are going to speak today? They see that we're a friendly and wonderful audience. There are many things to go around, but just want to make sure that we highlight some. Girls Inc. of the Valley, Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts, the Republican, Springfield Museums, the Human Service Forum, Springfield Public Libraries, and everybody on our team. I know Lori Cirillo, Tracy Trial, Crystal, there are so many names. Long Metal TV, Tracy Durant, who's in the back, give her a wave. We are now being broadcast on Long Metal TV with an all-woman media cast. Is that true? Give them a round of applause, which is great. Um, so you'll see many different faces along the way, um, and all of our speakers, as you see them, I express my thanks to everyone who is speaking. So as we enter our first Brave Space number one, come forward. And these are our students who are going to share their thoughts. Um, 
they will come forth and everyone will stand up for all of the students come forth if you're in that first wave. The students are standing together because I hopefully you know that in 1977 for the first federally sponsored women's conference, we could go back to 1850, the first women's conference in Worcester. This was the style. Women would line together to the podium, say what they had to say and they would be affirmed in who they are. So we're doing a style, and the students are getting used to a style that has come over the generations. And we can see from the latest women's marches, that's how they do it. We've all been relegated to one to two minutes, so if anybody gets the, it means enough. But we love you, <laughs> but we love you. <laughs> And as you can see for many of the students, and you will see even some of the faculty today, you will see some of them wearing our Bay Path colors in honor of Dr. Leary. So yeah, so I said, I even got my jacket from the 70s that I am now wearing, so it's all good. So come forward. Hello, my name is Allison Zaksinski. I am a professional writing major and I am a business owner. Hi, my name is Erin Banis. I am a writer for the newsletter as well as I'm the Study Abroad Alumni Ambassador. Hello, I am Megan Griffin. I'm a writer and peer mentor, and we are all Bay Path University students. We are looking to our future after Bay Path. The wage gap in our country is an issue that will be affecting us soon. It is disheartening to know we will make less than our male counterparts. Once we leave our campus, filled with empowerment, support systems, and opportunities for the advancement of women, we enter the workforce. Women currently hold the majority of all bachelor's and master's degrees in the country, and yet still earn 78 cents to the dollar earned by each man in the same position. We deserve appropriate pay for our level of education. We have spent the last few years bettering ourselves at Bay Path University and preparing ourselves for the future. As we meet here today, connecting with strong, empowered women in our community, we want to spread awareness on this issue because we are worth it. Hi again. Our topic of discussion is the expectations for how women should look in the workplace and how they are portrayed by media. Studies have found that we have an unconscious attractiveness bias and that attractiveness can impact hiring, promotions, and compensation. Women who are considered more attractive are seen as more favorable candidates regardless of their background experience and education. Women are expected to be perfect, like a Barbie doll, no imperfections and no flaws. You have to act a certain way, a way different than how the men act. Not only are we pitted against the, other, the opposite gender, but we are also pitted against each other. Women are meant to have straight hair and new colored clothes, no afros or brightly colored hair or anything that could express fun. We're victims of hypocrisy. Cover up too much and we're prudes, but show too much and we're promiscuous. When will this stop? What example are we setting for the future of women when we can't even breathe without judgment? Join us in being voices of change for generations to come. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kiana McClure, and I'm a junior in the communications department at Bay Path. My name is Kayla Vance. I'm a junior communications major and a sports journalist for the Network News. My name is Yuhan Huang. I'm a senior student. And also in our group is our lovely uh, videographer, Andre Alice. And today we are here to speak about reproductive rights. But for a show of hands, how many women in this room have at some point been concerned about their reproductive rights? Exactly. Birth control became illegal in the United States in 1870 due to the Federal Comstock Act. The social purity movement at the time believed that contraceptives counted as having a preemptive abortion, therefore keeping all women from being able to access resources to prevent pregnancy. In 1965, the Supreme Court ruled that in the case Griswold versus Connecticut that it was unconstitutional to prohibit married couples from using birth control, despite at the time 26 states explicitly prohibited it. Reproductive rights are important because for so long, women have denied the right to make decisions about their own bodies. 
Women's reproductive rights have been erosion from 1870 to 1965. Reproductive rights is especially important for unmarried women, but 26 states denied this right. We have to fight for our reproductive rights. We have a heartbeat too. Women who don't control their reproductive rights are not real free by Annie DeFranco. Also, we made a bookmark on our net website, Network News. Please check it. Thank you. Are they on the right track? Yes, give them another round of applause. And the book presentation? Um, this part is, is really, really near and dear to our heart because um, when people put together history and want to share it with all of us, it's a blessing. Um, and these two gentlemen and a host of community members who put together The Power of Women, this powerful book that we base a lot of this research on for the walking tour and everything. So we just want to officially launch the walking trail with Rosemary Jackson, if she will come forward. Crystal, Crystal Battle Brown, if come forth. Um, these are two, and if Dr. Leary would come forth too, um, because uh, these are historic women in our community. You can stand on this side. Um, and I know Dr. Leary already has a book. We're going to have you stand on this side with them. Um, because we're going, and you, yes, we're going to present the book. And Dr. Leary, you can present this one to Crystal. And uh, oh, actually to Rosemary. And you can present this one to, um, actually to uh, Crystal. And just to let you know, Crystal is featured in the book. If you don't have this book, this is a book you need to get. They will be sitting at the table. There are order forms um, because it has all of the history of the women in this region. Rosemary Jackson. Now, get, let me get this right. What year grad of Bay Pass? 1961 grad of Bay Pass. Give her a, can we give her a standing ovation? I mean, 61. Yes. 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 And. And you have worked for Mount Holyoke for how many years? Actually, I retired um, when, I, when it was 28 years. And then they called me back, and I worked for two more years. So actually, 30 years. 30 years, Mount Holyoke. Yes, and what a treasure. Yes. And Crystal Battle Brown, she's probably one of the youngest world trekkers who has been to every continent in the world. She is our local explorer. She also has a book. She will be here as well. Um, and anyone who has that budding travel, Crystal is the one. And you did the, all of this under age 40. Yes. And give her a round of applause. North Pole, South Pole, everything in between. And she also named her daughter, who was on your last trip, Sydney, after Sydney, Australia. Yes. Yeah, we all got that one. So this is the official launch. Can we give a launch of the new walking trail? A round of applause. It's there if you want to see it. And uh, we look forward to be offering tours soon. So this is great. Thank you so much. And you, there's going to be a video. Would you like to say something about the video? Uh, yeah, we, um, we have the video that goes with the book. And I, uh, I want to say one thing is that the majority of the writing in this book was done by women. You know, Joe and I were just along for the road. You know. uh, but uh, the other thing is today, as we speak, there are two women walking in space for the first time ever. You know, so, you know. And now, um, if you turn your heads that way, <laughs> uh, we'll, uh, we'll have the... Uh, little movie. Uh. From the Native Americans who populated our region long before the Mayflower made landfall, to 21st century role models of all faiths, races, gender identity, and ethnicity, women have toiled to improve their lives in a struggle that dates back centuries. In 1776, the year our nation was formed, 
Massachusetts' own Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, the then future President John Adams. I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Abigail's desire was not achieved for another 144 years of political activism for all American women to have the right to vote. The importance of women's education could not be overstated. Knowledge is power, and what started as an unequal balance between the education of men and women has now had the tables turned. Since the 1970s, women have accounted for more college degrees than men, and women of color are finally seeing more opportunities. Our region has many women heroes who have made and continue to make great strides in women's education. Women from our region stepped forward in leadership roles during our nation's greatest test. The long fight to end slavery culminated in the Civil War. Abolitionists Sojourner Truth and Sarah Lawrence Robinson, along with nurses Clara Barton and Dorothea Dix, played leading roles during the era of the Civil War. Many women from our region gathered to make bandages and clothing for the troops, while others filled the void left by military-aged men in local industries. Our region has been especially rich in women who have put pens to paper or fingertips to keyboards for centuries. While living as a slave in Deerfield, Lucy Terry Prince, at the age of 21, wrote one of America's first poems during the French and Indian War. Here, Emily Dickinson gazed out upon Amherst in the 1800s and was inspired to write poetry that continues to affect and inspire readers the world over. A champion of the women's suffrage movement, Minnie Dwight served as publisher and editor of the Hoyoke Transcript for almost 30 years. Hoyoke is the home of Leslie Newman, author of 70 books for readers of all ages, among them the landmark children's book, Heather Has Two Mommies. Anita Shreve wrote many of her earlier works while living in Longmeadow. Suzanne Strempick Shea of Bondsville has mastered many forms of the craft, from journalism, essays, and short stories, to novels and nonfiction work. The list continues to the delight of readers everywhere. Truly, there is a treasure trove of locally written works by women of note spanning the centuries. The Industrial Revolution, which began in the Connecticut River Valley, required thousands of mill workers, the majority of whom were women. Native-born women workers were soon joined by waves of new immigrants from Canada and Europe. In the late 19th century, a number of women from our region began their own business enterprises. They became models for successive generations of businesswomen and women in male-dominated professions. In the 20th century, during World War I and World War II, women answered the call of duty by joining the factory workforce in places like the Springfield Armory. The post-war years witnessed the decades-long struggle to achieve equality in the workforce, a struggle that continues today. In the 21st century, our region is fortunate to have a significant number of remarkable women business leaders. For many women in the military during the War of 1812, the Civil War, and the Spanish-American War, work would center on service as nurses. Others would be spies, and many would serve in support roles. It was not until World War I that women were formally allowed to join the U.S. Armed Forces, with more than 30,000 serving as nurses and support staff to the U.S. military. The number of American women serving in the military grew exponentially during World War II, with nearly 350,000 women in uniform serving from 1941 through 1945. In every military conflict since, from Korea to Vietnam, to the Persian Gulf, and today on active duty in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, women serve in every branch of the military. Gazing through microscopes and telescopes, women have participated in humanity's quest to explain the universe. As astronauts, women from our region have bravely explored outer space and have broken the ultimate glass ceiling. It is because of their spirit and thirst to compete that pioneers of women's sports, such as Senda Berenson at Smith College, have paved the road for today's women to enjoy the level of competition and achievement that defines the modern arena of competitive sport. 
The arena of sport allowed women to be strong, powerful, and taught them not to be afraid of life's battles. It is an important reminder that when girls and women engage in play, they use the creativity of their minds for imagination and invention, and they develop the rudimentary skills of negotiation and governance. They begin to lay the foundation to become the leaders of their own future. From the mid-1800s to today, women composers, performers, and music educators have played an important role in the cultural life of this region. These women run the gamut from concert singers in the 19th century to popular music entertainers in the 20th and 21st centuries. Not confined to regional success, many of these women were well-traveled both in the United States and abroad. It is also amazing how many women from Western and Central Massachusetts have graced the professional stage and entertained the nation through radio, television, and film performances since the 19th century. From Eva Tangway of Holyoke, who became the queen of vaudeville, to silent film actress Carol Holloway of Williamstown, who appeared in 117 silent films, to Eleanor Powell of Springfield, who acted and danced her way to Hollywood fame in the 1930s, to Pittsfield's Elizabeth Banks. Of today's most popular Hollywood films, our region has produced some of the nation's most famous actresses and entertainers. Two extremely talented African-American women from Springfield broke down barriers to rise to the very top of their fields. Cheryl Boone Isaacs, 35th president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and Ruth E. Carter, Oscar-winning costume designer for film and television with over 40 films to her credit. In a region known for its innovators and trailblazers, it's not surprising to find that same entrepreneurial spirit in the region's philanthropic women. As a result of their efforts, you can find museums, colleges, preschools, historic homes, and an internationally known music festival, all started by women. These women voluntarily gave their time, energy, and expertise, as well as their financial resources, to pursue a vision of a brighter, healthier, more vibrant community. 2018 is considered the year of the woman in politics, local, statewide, and national, with a record number of female candidates running for elective office. While Americans were debating the rights of women throughout most of U.S. history, Individual women from Western and Central Massachusetts were working hard to improve the lives and fortunes of their gender, their families, and themselves. They instigated and nurtured a long and rich tradition of participation that shaped the public world and their private lives through politics, law, and government service. Women from our region broke records, from being the first woman to register to vote in Springfield, the first woman police chief in New England, to the first woman to be elected as governor of any state in the nation without following her husband into the office. It took 92 years from the time women gained the right to vote to see a woman from Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, elected to the U.S. Senate in 2012. The first in a series of National Women's Rights Conventions was held in Worcester, Massachusetts on October 23rd and 24th in 1850 at the initiative of Lucy Stone and Paulina Wright Davis. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton met the following year in 1851. Their decades-long collaboration was pivotal for the suffrage movement and contributed significantly to the broader struggle for women's rights, which Stanton called the greatest revolution the world has ever known or ever will know. The fight continues today, where hundreds of thousands have taken to the streets for equality in pay and for protection from harassment. The Power of Women book records a journey that is far from over. We hope we have provided a history and a presence that bring us to today. But there is so much more to do, many battles to fight for economic and power parity. The path that has led us to today is paved by women who have risked everything to make a difference. They have lit that path to the future. Welcome to all those who travel down that path. Thank you so much.
And again, if you're interested in the book, they will be here and uh, there are forms. And now I'd like the women on the move to come up for their one minute moments. And um, we'll have Lynn Pellerano, Alicia Gay, Tanisha Arena, uh, Resica, uh, Rachel Jessica Daniel, if she's here, Yadalette Rivera, Nikai Fondin, and Andrea. And these are our one minute moments keeping our hope alive. Here we go. Good morning, my name is Lynn Pellerano, president of the Bay Path Alumni Association and a university trustee. I've had the privilege of knowing President Leary for about 10 years of her 25 year legacy here at Bay Path. From the moment I met her, I knew she was a force to be reckoned with because of her passion, commitment, and almost superhuman energy. Many of us know the impact as an educator she has had throughout her career, but most notably the impact on women's education. She and her team have created an innovative way for women to learn on their terms, and this model has proven to be resoundingly successful. I can attest to its success because I myself am a graduate of the One Day Saturday program and then proceeded on to get my MBA from Bay Path. President Leary has been known to say, everyone has the capacity to learn if they are in the right learning environment and they are in the right frame of mind. Women today need to have many options available to obtain the education they desire in ways that fit into their lives. And also, they actually need to be able to afford an education. President Leary and the Bay Path team have created the right environment for all women to learn in the manner that works best for them. Because Bay Path offers education in these ways, that positively impacts the student's frame of mind as they are not at odds with how to get the education they desire while still fulfilling all of their other responsibilities. Bay Path has also enabled countless women to pursue their higher education because of the financial support they've been able to provide. I am very proud that Bay Path is leading the way in this manner. In closing, I, I along with countless others, are very grateful we have had President Leary for the past 25 years as she inspires all women to seize the opportunity to learn. One of the most memorable ways that she inspires all of us women is she can be found saying very often to anybody she interacts with, when you're asked to dance, you should dance. I personally want to thank her for everything she's done and wish her the very best as she dances off into the future next year. The LGBTQ community enjoys more acceptance than perhaps ever before, but there are still issues on our minds every day. The most pressing, perhaps, is the case presented to the Supreme Court this past Tuesday, October 8th. The highest court in the land is considering whether Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which protects workers um, based on sex, um, will that protection be based on sexual orientation? And second, whether the law protects workers who are transgender. If the court decides that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act does apply to the millions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender employees across the nation, we could gain the same basic protections that other groups have been granted. However, the question at hand for this divided court is whether discrimination ba based on sexual orientation is a form of sex discrimination. If the court rules that sexual orientation and transgender status are not covered under Title VII, the effect for the LGBTQ community will be massive. The LGBTQ people already face high rates of unemployment discrimination, which will only increase with a ruling that effectively states that discrimination against us is in fact not discrimination. Additionally, the implications reach beyond the workplace because the doors will be open to discrimination in other areas, such as housing, access to healthcare, education, and many more, leaving us vulnerable to violence based on an assumed justification. Currently, there is an epidemic of violence toward black trans women. Some experts state that if the court rules that discrimination on the base of sex stereotypes is legal, then anyone who does not conform to an employer's view of femininity or masculinity 
could be at risk, leaving women of all races likely feeling the brunt of this decision. For example, cisgender heterosexual women, which are women who identify as women but are attracted to men. Those particular women may want to wear a tie to work, may want to have short hair, but legally they could be fired if discrimination based on assumed sexual orientation becomes legal. So if you are in the audience thinking that LGBTQ issues do not affect you, you are mistaken. This decision can have, an enormous, can have enormous implications on all humans, especially women. Title VII is meant to prohibit discrimination, period, and we cannot afford to be silent. Discrimination to one group can lead to discrimination to all groups. Good morning. Ooh, I'm overwhelmed. This is a great way to start Friday. <laughs> um, so my name is Alicia Gay, and I'm from the Women's Fund of Western Mass. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar, um, the Women's Fund services the four counties in Western Mass by creating opportunities and access for women and girls um, through the Lippy program and YWI. Um, we also help fund organizations that focus on creating access and opportunities for women and girls. Um, in partnership with Public Health Institute, the research report on the status of women and girls was released and can be found on our website. I also have a few copies with me. And uh, the Women's Fund will be using the report um, to inform our future grant making strategies. Um, and we're encouraging partners to use the uh, research report for the same. Uh, we have a couple of upcoming events this month. Um, the Berkshire Lippy Link and Research Report Listening Session, which will be in Pittsfield at 4 o'clock. Also, we have the Dr. Valerie Young Imposter Syndrome Seminar at the Community Music School in Springfield at 4.30. Um, I also uh, have materials for that, and you can see our upcoming events on our website. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanisha Arena, and I am the executive director of Arise for Social Justice, located right here in Springfield. We're actually about a block that way. Thank you. Um, as many of you know, our co-founder, Michael Ambusi, passed away in August of this year, and that was a tremendous loss to the city of Springfield and just to the social justice community on the whole. Uh, we are still doing our work in those ways, and there's lots of work that needs to be done. Um, Arise focuses on issues around housing and economic justice, homelessness, environmental justice, criminal justice. Uh, we have a mold committee, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, the work has not stopped. You know, as uh, the previous speakers have mentioned, you know, there are protections that are being brought into question, your basic humanity, human rights, Housing is a human right. The right to go to work, to be who you are. That's, those are rights for everybody. Those are things that we focus on at Arise. You know, coming in as the uh, new ED uh, with the background in youth work, um, domestic violence work, I believe in creating a safe space inside the, inside the building, outside in our community, and passing on this message that nothing about us without us. Women's voices belong at the table. Women belong in leadership. Like, we, we've been doing this work since forever. Um, I invite you to check out our website. I have information available. Um, we have a fundraiser coming up in November featuring the Joe Salins Band. Um, it's a rise and dance for climate justice, uh, which is also honoring the legacy of Michael Lamb because she was passionate about environmental justice work. Um, and it is a crisis right now because there is no planet B. All of the other issues don't matter if we don't have a place to call home. So I invite you to check out our website. I'll be here to answer questions, to make connections, um, and I appreciate the support of Springfield. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Jadilet Rivera-Colón. 
And I don't say that to sound pretentious, but I say that because there's not many doctors who look like me. My passion and what I really want to do with my life is to inspire everybody to be the best they can be, especially those girls who want to become scientists in the future. I love the book, The Power of Women, and one of the things that I would ask, even just by looking at the video, if you haven't had the chance to get the book, please do so, um, is the fact that how long in the video was dedicated to women in science? It was probably about nine seconds. And that's not the author's fault. It's the fact that there's no information about who are the women in science. At Bay Path University, I get the opportunity to get a job that pays my bills, but also to get to do the work I want to do, which is amazing, and I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. We are changing that. The way that we're doing that, we get this wonderful sequence of courses called Women as Empowered Learners and Leaders, which if you don't know about that, you should definitely check it out, is the fact that we can do something about it, and I am going to do something about it. I am taking a class of 19 young women who are teaching young girls about who are the women in STEM, not only in their community, but also around the world, and how can they become trailblazers should they decide to pursue a career in STEM. So I, I am living my dream, and I want other people to be able to do the same. So get up and fight for your rights, but also think about lifting others with you. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm Gina Semperbon, and I'm a professor at Bay Path University of Biology. And um, I just want to say I'm so delighted that women are up in space because the reason I'm a scientist today is because of the moonwalk. When I saw that as a little girl, it totally inspired me to go into science. If there had been women walking on the moon at that time, I would have gotten my PhD a lot sooner. I can tell you that much. I also want to give a, a, a shout out to the Springfield Science Museum because I'm a paleontologist today because of a dinosaur exhibit I saw when I was a little girl. I was obsessed with their stegosaurus, and I still am. And, uh, and it's the reason I'm doing what I'm doing. But I, I really just really briefly, because Janine, you know, didn't expect me up here. I just really wanted to briefly say something about history, uh, about Bay Path. Uh, Carol Leary will, will uh, hear me out on this and, and, and uh, back me up. When, right before she came to Bay Path, we had very few, uh, very limited uh, majors for women. They were very traditional. So we had things like interior design and travel administration, fashion. <laughs> Uh, early childhood education. Once we got uh, Carol Leary, and uh, if you don't know Carol Leary, uh, you know, don't get anywhere near her because the energy she gives off might knock you right over. Uh, we got an entrepreneurial president, and what happened therein was truly remarkable. Today, 50% or more of our students are STEM majors. And that is truly remarkable, because when Carol came, we didn't even have any science majors. And so 50% of our students are now going out and blazing a trail. So I just wanted to thank her for being so entrepreneurial and allowing us to build something truly remarkable. We have a Center of Excellence for Women in STEM, the only one I know of in the country. We have a LEAD program devo devoted only for STEM, for women that are already out there in STEM, and we are knocking it. We are knocking it. So thank you so much. Good morning. It is so exciting to be here and to be recognized as a woman on the move. My name is Dr. Rachel Jessica Daniel. I'm an, an associate professor of English at Massasoit Community College, as well as a dean of English language arts at New Heights Charter School of Brockton, as well as sometimes a part-time professor of Bay Path. <laughs> so it's awesome to finally put faces to emails that I get. Um, um, today I'm here to represent um, the book project that Professor Fondin and I and so many wonderful women um, coming out of UMass have been, been working on. It's called, tentatively, It's Our Movement Now, 
Black Women in the 1977 National Women's Conference. And what this collection seeks to uncover and recover are all of the stories of powerful black women activists and politicians who contributed in powerful ways to that conference. Um, it is our responsibility here, all of us, to not only do good work now, but to represent the women who are behind us, who, without whose work, we would not be here. Um, so I'm really thankful to be here. I'm looking forward to continuing to work on this project. We have a draft uh, together. There are a, a lot of, of publishers who are very excited. And um, I, I look forward to continuing to work with Professor Fondon on it. Um, please look forward to interesting stories about Coretta Scott King, Maxine Waters, Barbara Jordan, and so many others. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Nakai Fonden, also known as Janine and Tom Fonden's daughter. <laughs> um, but today, I am here to represent the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts, um, specifically their scholarships program. I am the program associate for scholarships. Um, our program is super robust. We support students. We are the, one of the largest funders of students in the Pioneer Valley. Um, and that makes our program super robust. We have over 135 scholarship funds. That means 135 scholarship opportunities for students to take advantage of. Um, we give out about $2.2 .2 million in scholarships to over 800 students um, across the Pioneer Valley, which is an amazing effort. Um, and super, a lot of work for me, but I love it. <laughs> But it's a, a super rewarding um, field to be in. And of course, my work has always been in youth. And supporting our youth in higher education is super important to empowering not only women, but students across the board. And one of the greatest things about our program is that you do not have to be a traditional student to get an award from us. Thank you. Um, and one of the things that is great is that you can be 40 going to graduate school and you can still get a scholarship from us. We have plentiful opportunities. We have an interest-free loan pro program, um, which is an amazing opportunity as well. Who wouldn't want an interest-free loan? I mean, in these days and times, it's an amazing opportunity. So um, our application opens up on January 1st, 2020. Um, if you want any more information about it, please come and contact me and I will definitely walk you through the process. So. Again, my name is Nakai Fondant, and I'm representing the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts. And I also want to say that Nakai will also be shepherding a movement to garner all of the young women um, in our communities, for all the young women, and the women who want to be young and in that category, just see Nakai. So, um, and this time our Freedom Rider uh, is having a little uh, delay this morning, so we're just gonna move on and we will catch her at the end of the program. Is she here? Oh, she's here. Okay, good, 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 good. I did not see her come in, all righty. Um, but before that, we have our last messages from our students. If they will come forward, the Brave Space 2. Um, that's the last messages from our students and then we'll go to our um, legislators. And I also want to give a shout out to my husband and all the men in the room who support all of us wonderful women doing what we do. Hello, um, I'm Melissa Fantato and I am a first year student at Baypath. Uh, and I'm uh, trying to major in uh, child psychology. So, go ahead. Oh, hi, my name is Cora Swan. I'm a freshman and I, my major is digital media and film. As women, we have per persevered, we had to persevere through discrimination and sexism uh, in all forms. Sexism has evolved and shifted throughout time but we've shifted change and changed along with it. But ultimately, 
we are not finished with it quite yet. I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room is aware of the wage gap between women and men. Most of the women in this room have had to deal with it. But there is one thing we don't usually take into account. How does the wage gap affect women of different races? We've been told all, all our lives that women make 78 cents to every man's dollar. But this is not true for every woman. In reality, this number only affects white women. Black women only make 75 cents to every man's dollar on average, and Hispanic women eat, make even less with, at 58 cents. I'm sure many of you have already knew this, but for those who don't, why do you think that's the case? Maybe this might be due to a certain blind spot that we can develop towards different forms of discrimination. Now, this isn't to demonize women or turn us against each other, but pointing out this blind spot to our movement is so we can acknowledge that while we all struggle for equality, that some of us have a farther way to go than others. And if we're to truly evolve, we need to address our blind spots and support each other, regardless of creed. Hello, I'm Julia DeRitter. I'm a first year at Bay Path, and I'm an exploratory major, which is just their fancy way of saying undecided. Um, and I'm Shannon Thomas, and I'm a first year professional writing major. Times have changed for women in the leadership roles that much is certain. Statistics show that the number of women presidents of universities has tripled since 1986, and Dr. Leary has proven that it is more than possible for a woman to change the course of a university. And the number of women holding seats in government is increasing. We grew up in a time of progress, change, and more representation than ever, and not just for women. However, there is always the knowledge that history shows that when social change goes one step forward, it heeds two steps back. Keeping this in mind, we remain cautiously optimistic that generations after us will continue to feel the progress we have made to get a more equal representation of all genders into leadership positions. The key to increasing this trend is continued education and empowerment as Bay Path University so tries to instill in us. Knowledge of where we come from and insight as to how much more we can grow will ensure our roots in the soil of history, looked back at in a time where all voices are heard and cherished. We'd like to thank those in this room who have continued in this drive for equality of all in every corporate, educational, nonprofit, and jobs we have yet to imagine. Our voices will continue to rise in number and volume, and we will not be diminished. Thank you. Hello, I'm Allison, and this is Tabitha, and we have a question. How do you step into your legacy? We all have a legacy. The Freedom Riders, like Jean Denton Thompson, who you're about to hear from, were brave. She set out on her journey knowing full well that challenges were not just a possibility, they were certain. Knowing that, she became completely willing to cast off the life she knew for the life she knew she could have. Dr. Carol Leary set out on her mission to celebrate ordinary women doing extraordinary things. Through personal commitment to education, leadership, collaboration, she encouraged each one of us to become the woman of our dreams, transforming Bay Path into the dynamic and diverse university that it is today. One night she stopped by and stepped into her legacy. 25 years later, this is the most educated generation of women in history. This is the most financially capable generation of women in history. And dare I say, the most unstoppable generation of women in history. <laughs> I agree. What we want for ourselves, we want for the entire world. For all people to be able to dream big, achieve big, and live a life beyond our wildest dreams. How can that be possible for you and me? Step into your light. What sparks that match? What ignites that flame? What is waiting deep inside of you that fires your soul? What in your world has been so broken that you would do anything to rise up if you knew it would get better? When you know that, ask yourself, how uncomfortable are you willing to get? That commitment to your truth that dedication to follow your path isn't guaranteed to come easily. Jean Denton Thompson and Carol Leary would be the first ones to tell you that. 
but along the way, you'll leave a trail of change. That trail is your legacy. You are your legacy. So I have the pleasure of introducing freedom writer Jean Tenton Thompson up to the stage. Thank you. I didn't expect all of this. <laughs> Uh, good morning. I guess you know who I am. I am Jean Denton Thompson. I live now in Amherst, Massachusetts, but I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, and have lived on both sides of this country. Uh, lived in New York for a couple of years, and I lived in San Francisco for 10 years. So I guess I am American. <laughs> um, I'm sort of lost for words, mainly because there's some dynamic people, mainly women in this room, and I hope I can inspire people. Um, but one of the main things I heard listening to people is legacy and the reason why I became active and we used to call it then the civil rights movement but now it's called social justice it was because of the legacy of my family I came from some very strong women and men, but I have to look at my family and a lot of stuff I got from my mother. And I remembered when I was about four or five, we used to go to the Ottoman Park Zoo in New Orleans, which I guess you can tell by my, all these, I was a freedom rider, so that must have been in the 60s, so given that, and I was 19 at the time in 1961, so I must have grown up during the 40s and the 50s. Well, New Orleans was extremely segregated. The only time that you could go to uh, any of the parks and stuff like that was on a uh, Sunday. Well, anyway, my mom had seven kids, and we all went, and we walked all over the place, and I was tired. And she said, go sit down, and I sat down on a bench. Cop comes over and told her that, no, uh, your child has to move. And my mom told him, my child is going to sit right there, and Jean, don't you move. And I didn't move, but that type of attitude was in my family. Uh, when I, uh, when the Freedom Rides started, I remember my parents telling us that segregation wasn't going to last forever, and when that, when the time comes, you have to step forward. The time came, and I stepped forward. Whatever that based upon was what my family told me, my mother in particular. So, and. That's the reason why I said what I did in the 60s was based upon the legacy of my parents. I absorbed the same thing. I was participated in the, uh, the Freedom Rise voter education and a lot of other different social justice, mainly uh, back in the 60s also people were identified as being hippies. They were discriminated against. I worked with a group of people that started looking at the needs of the people they were called alternative people. 
Uh, and the things that we found was that women were isolated. The, uh, there were a lot of children, what to have, things to, that they needed. And uh, there were a lot of people who had mental needs. So we got a little money together, only $10,000. We can just, you wouldn't believe what we did with the $10,000, but with that, we were able to get fun uh, play groups. We were able to uh, set up a child care switchboard so women would be able to call in and tell us what they needed. And then we set up rap sessions with what people call now a uh, uh, therapeutic session where people can come together and talk about the needs. The other thing we found out that most of the people who contacted us were not women from the alternative community. It were women who lived in the burbs, suburbs. And so we also reached out to them also. And one of the things we wanted to, to uh, fund was a crisis intervention place for women. And we submitted that proposal to the, the uh, health department. Now this is in 1971, and we were told that was foolish, would never happen, because who is gonna take care of these women? No one is going to fund it. But two years later, San Francisco funded it. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is, because I see a lot of people of color, a lot of women of color, I was involved with trying to get active women of color to come together. And this was in, in the 70s. And and we wanted to do um, uh, after school programs, which was based upon what had happened in Freedom Summer in 64. But we wanted to establish something like that in San Francisco. We went on for, okay, we, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, we did that for, for a while, but one of the major things I wanted to say is to the rest of you, in order for us to get any kind of change in this country and in, in this kind of world, we have to learn how to work with each other, not just because of your own kind, because all of that is still going to be there after you get your freedom, but that's just for some people. It should be just freedom and justice and peace for all people, in order for us to get that, and I mean us, all of us, all y'all, I guess somebody would, all amigos, all amigas, we have to work, we have to be like that. And the other thing is keep in mind your goals because you will always have somebody who may try to step in and control. It's supposed to be an equal thing and we work together as one. Unity, keep that in mind all the time, is unity. Because you can't get any place without unity. You're still gonna have the uh, division. So you have to keep one, don't, don't divide it. That's all I have to say, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I know, he's just going in the moment. And wasn't that a, what a treat to have her with us and uh, hear that message. 
And now we're going to hear from our legislators, and we're going to hear from Eric and um, Marvina. Would all of our legislative folks come forward? And Brian Ash, come forward. We have a few proclamations and then words from Eric. And also, um, any others in the room? Pol politicians, I want to make sure we cover everybody. Uh, Yolanda, just say hello. Yolanda's running for office, right? Are we running for office? Yes. Mayor, woman running? Yes. Thank you. All right. Wow. Good morning. What a beautiful crowd here today. It is great to stand here before you. On behalf of my boss, Jose Tosado, the Honorable Jose Tosado, I bring greetings. He represents the 9th Hampton District, along with his colleagues, Senator Lesser and State Representative Brian Ash. I stand before you to bring great greetings from the House and the Senate of the Great and General Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I stand to say thank you to all of you who are gathered here today. And as I look at this sign, and it says the power of women, it takes a lot sometimes for women. We have a lot of responsibilities to even get up and go about our day. So look at your neighbor and just say, the power of women on today. Thank you. Special honor to all of those who are involved with the program here today. The Springfield Library Museum administration and staff, our local municipal organizations and company here on today. A special thank you to Professor Janine Fonda and Dr. Larry for having me here today, to the wonderful students of Bay Path and the beautiful writers and speakers and remarkable women that we heard from on this morning. My assignment is brief. But how brief can you be when you're standing in a room with so many remarkable people? I have two citations to present to two extraordinary women whose story goes without saying. So can I have, please come forth, Dr. Carol Leary and Ms. Jean Ditton Thompson, please? I will start with Jean. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Ms. Jean Denton Thompson, a Freedom Rider, Congress of Racial Equality member, known as CORE, and civil rights activist. In recognition of your being honored by the Conversation Legacy of Women and Power of Women's Leadership Forum 2019 for your heroic leadership and bravery as a black woman freedom rider, a trailblazer who fought for justice, racial equality, and human rights during the height of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, for your notable contributions as a powerful woman legendary in the history of the United States of America. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortunes and continued success in all endeavors. Given this day, October 18, 2019, signed by the Speaker of the House, Robert A. DeLeo, offered by State Representative Jose Tosado, State Representative Brian Ash, Congratulations and thank you for all that you've done in making history.
Dr. Carol Leary. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, be it hereby known to all, the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Dr. Carol Leary, the president of Bay Path University. You're being honored here today for the power of women, the legacy of all your contributions in standing here before us in participation of this Women's Leadership Forum 2019. As one of the guest speakers, your stupendous pace setting leadership of Bay Path University for some 25 years and for your notable contributions across the globe and the greater Springfield community. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and express the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all of your endeavors. Given this day as well, October 18, 2019, signed by the Speaker of the House, Robert DeLeo, offered by my boss, the Honorable State Jose Tassado and State Representative Brian Ash. Thank you so much for all you do. That concludes my part of the program. <laughs> well, I've got about five seconds left, so. <laughs> oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it really is my honor to be here this morning. Uh, I was sitting there, I was thinking about some of the women in my life that have really empowered me and really motivated me. And I think back, you know, my mom, like I'm sure many of you, was my first inspiration and, and sadly she died when I was 11. So throughout my life, I think I've, I've tried to find women that inspired me. And uh, throughout life I've had many friends that were, were women or girls growing up. And I've been blessed, you know, I've been married for 26 years now. We'll be together actually 30 years in November. Um, and I'm so proud of my wife. She's an entrepreneur, she started her own business, she does graphic design. We have two children, a son and a daughter, and our daughter is a sophomore student athlete at Springfield College, sorry, not Bay Path, but, and she plays field hockey there. And when I look at her, when I look at my wife, I'm so inspired by what they do. And what I do every day, I really try to emulate through them, and I try to make them proud of me. And that's my personal life, but in my professional life, I've had many women that have inspired me, and one of the first one was Dr. Leary. Now, I've been in elected office just under 20 years, and one of the first people that I met was Dr. Leary back in uh, 2000. And she had the energy, she had the enthusiasm, the poise, and the elegance. And I knew she was a, a badass, too. <laughs> but I knew she was cool, because the first time I ever met her, she invited me to meet the Princess of Thailand. So I said, all right, she's got it going on. <laughs> And she does, she has it going on. And I'm so proud to call her a friend. I'm so proud to be her state representative. And I'm so proud of everybody here and to be sitting here listening to all the women here and to the inspiring stories from, from the students, from the speakers, or Freedom Rider. It, it really does move me. So thank you so much. Thank you for letting us be a, a small part of this morning. And God bless each and every one. Thank you. Good morning. Is it afternoon yet or no? <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I just want to first introduce myself. I know a lot of familiar faces uh, here today, but my name is Eric Lesser. I have the honor uh, of being the state center that represents Bay Path and so many communities, nine communities in the Pioneer Valley. And I want to thank my colleagues, Marvina, of course, uh, who's a great friend and colleague. We work together on so many issues. And of course, uh, Rep. Tosado, who's a great ally and friend on so many issues. We're working together on the substance abuse uh, crisis right now and, and so many other topics. And my, my friend and someone I've looked up to for a long, long time, uh, State Rep. Brian Ash. Uh, I just want to just get a couple things off my chest. Uh, we'll, we'll dispense with the, with the citations to save time because it's a bicameral legislature. It's the same thing. It's just the House and the Senate both have to say it. Uh, but we have copies of all of it. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you to you, Carol. Uh, you are uh, just such an unbelievable presence for us. And when I think about the role Bay Path has played in Western Mass and really statewide, really countrywide, 
the impact you've had is really incredible. On a personal level, I'm going to miss you, uh, but, uh, but your, your legacy and the work you've done is really going to ripple out for so many years and so many generations to come. So thank you so, so much, Carol. We really appreciate you. And I, I, I just want to, I, I want to thank uh, Gene Denton Thompson. Uh, you know, you, you lit a path for all of us to follow. Uh, and I couldn't help but think when you were speaking about the moment we're in now. Uh, and all of us, I believe, are called to our conscience to act. And just as history will be the judge of those who acted one way or the other in the 1960s, the 1970s, in, in that generation's struggle, we have a lot at stake in this generation as well. And your story and the risks you took when your life was literally on the line uh, need to be a call to action for all of us in this moment that we're in right now. So thank you so, so much to you uh, for the example you set. Uh, incredible uh, moment to have you here. And just indulge me for a second to talk about my friend uh, Janine, uh, Janine Fondin. So I want to address the young uh, women who came up and, and all of the young women who are here uh, who are thinking about political activism, getting involved. I ran for office when I was 28 years old and no one really gave me a chance when I first started. So what did I do? I went out and knocked on doors. Uh, and when you're out knocking on doors, oftentimes the most common thing is the door gets slammed back in your face. Uh, but I was knocking doors uh, one, I think it was a Saturday afternoon, and uh, this incredibly friendly person opened the door and actually talked to me. Uh, <laughs> I was sort of in shock. I didn't really know that it never really happened. So I was sort of in shock, but wow, there's a real person talking to me and who actually wants to hear uh, what, uh, what, what, what my campaign's about. And we uh, had a great conversation and we stayed in touch. And, um, and I've seen your career progress over the last several years. And, joining Bay Path and um, all the wonderful work you're doing, seeing your daughter uh, get up and speak, just so incredible. So I just want to thank you, uh, Professor Fond, and you're uh, just an unbelievable um, friend to me and someone who I really look up to. And we have a current blanche policy in our, in our office. When you send us an email or ask for something, we say yes, no matter what. <laughs> uh, so I just, I just, want, to, I just want to thank you. Um, and I, I, I know it's going, we're, I'm go, going on a little bit, but I, I just, a very important point I want to make about the, the theme tonight, uh, or today, this morning. Uh, when I was getting ready to get to, to come this morning, my wife, who a lot of you know, I know a lot of you work with my wife, Allison, she said, you know, what are you doing today, Eric? And I said, oh, I said, I'm going to speak at, a, at an event that Bay Path's putting on, you know, honoring women. And she looks at me with a kind of like eyebrow raise, and she's like, why are you speaking at an event? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm, I'm going to just be there to show my support. And she was, she's like, okay, great. And then she ran out the door. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I just want to say this, which is Massachusetts is a leader in so many ways. Uh, you know, we, we, we just passed and have implemented one of the most aggressive paid family medical leave policies in the entire country. We finally, after more than two decades, quite frankly, of work, uh, got a pay equity uh, piece of legislation passed a couple years ago. Rep. Ellen Story from Amherst was one of the key architects of that effort. There's so many things to be proud of and to point to in Massachusetts, but something that I'm not proud of is the fact that only 28% of our legislature is female. And in fact, we hold ourselves up as this progressive beacon here in Massachusetts, but we have one of the lower rates of female participation in our legislature. Uh, but I actually feel a lot of confidence because af after just hearing the speaking skills uh, and the presentation skills of the women who presented, uh, I think that we're going to be bending the arc and we're going to be uh, uh, we're going to be changing that uh, very soon. Uh, so I would just really ask everyone here, I, really a plea, uh, to get involved in politics, to get involved in government, to run for office. Um, politics has become almost a dirty word uh, in our culture. It doesn't have to be. Uh, at its best, serving a community, going out knocking on doors is about lifting up the people in your community and giving voice to the people around you. And, and quite frankly, as a piece of just kind of political advice, the moment we're in is really demanding change. Uh, and I work with a lot of young people, a lot of underrepresented groups, women, minorities, uh, who are trying to break into the political process. I spend a lot of time kind of coaching and training young candidates. And one thing that I've really observed, and, and my own example running as a 28-year-old, I think, showed this, is 
the most powerful argument in politics right now is that it's time for something different and it's time for a change. Lord knows we need that. Not going to get into everything going on all around us, but the point is, is if you maybe feel like you're from a, from a community or you're, uh, you're someone who, you know, you haven't seen someone like you in politics a lot uh, and that maybe people won't be supportive or won't be there to encourage you, I'm here to just tell you uh, that there will be a positive response. Uh, because if you're coming with a different perspective, if you're coming from a community that's maybe been on the margins of political representation in our country for a long time, that's going to be a tremendous asset in an era where people are looking for something new and are looking for something different. So go out there and do it. Give me a call. As long as you're not running against me, I'm happy to help you. Uh, so, so give me a call, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll work together to have that happen. So thank you so, so much, and congratulations to all of our awardees. My name is Jade and I am an alumni from Bay Path University. Um, Zoe and I will be presenting three citations from the State House as well. So if you hear your name, please come forward and probably take a photo or two. Yes. Jean Denton Thompson. <laughs> She's a yeah. okay. Dr. Leary. And of course, Professor Janine Fonden. want to say congratulations to all and also Brian Lees yeah. I just would give him a round of applause as well yes yes senator and we want to make sure all are recognized so thank you so much and then we're going to have comments okay. from you okay thank you so how does one end uh, this extraordinary morning for all of us and as I look out across the room, and I'm so honored to be in the presence of each and every one of you. Um, it, really, it really does make me feel more and more empowered as a woman. And I am just so thrilled to be able to just share a few thoughts with all of you. But as many of you know, I always start with the theme of gratitude. And I want us to do incredible hoots and hollers for Professor Janine Fonden, for all that she has done. Oh, not only in her career, but what she has done at Bay Path University, and for all of the women and men in this community with the On The Move program. Each year, it gets better and better. But what I love most of all about it is she includes everybody. And our students have the opportunity to speak and share their thoughts and understand in their hearts what it means to be a woman. And then she involves our incredible political colleagues. And I do believe what Senator Lesser said, that we do need more women. But aren't we proud of Senator Brian Lees, who served our legislature for so many years, and Senator Eric Lesser, and Representative Brian Ash, whose children went to the Bay Path Preschool. And Malvina, thank you for being here with, with words from Representative Tostado. We're blessed to have these incredible individuals, men who are leading our, our state, but really our country, and providing not only a voice, as Jean so beautifully said, Jean Thompson so beautifully said, it is not just the voice of women, it's the voice of men and women. It is unity that this whole, whole legislature is trying to endorse and promote. So we thank our state reps and senators very, very much. Let's give them a round of applause. 
and I do want to say to our students, your presentations were right on. The issues that you spoke about, about women, are right on. But I have to really recognize Jean Thompson, because Jean, we lived in a time when, you're right, there was segregation. And the Civil Rights Movement of 1964 was critical to this country and to where we are today. I am so proud that you stood, stood strong in that Freedom Writers era and were a representative of women, black women, who stood for the, for the rights of all, the rights of all. And I shared confidentially with Jean that I'm very proud of my husband, Noel, because when he was a young, young volunteer, the age of our students, he worked for the Poor People's Campaign and for Martin Luther King. And it was probably one of the most important moments of his life, and I've learned from my husband. So when we talk about the power of women, we have to talk about the power of men and women and what they have done to build our country. So Jean, really, I am so honored to be in the same room with you. Thank you. So when Janine asked me to share a few thoughts, and, and I knew this was part of my farewell tour, um, and my husband Noel says, God, Carol, it's like Cher. She keeps telling everybody she's retiring, <laughs> but she doesn't retire, and you are. So um, know that this is part of my farewell tour, and Janine asked me to make a, a few remarks, and I will try to be brief with them, about what it means to have the, the whole subject matter of the power of women and women as leaders. So I have to share that I continue to learn, and I continue to learn from our students. Two nights ago, I sat at dinner with a group of our students from 18 to 49 years of age. And we were there listening and being in the presence of an incredible woman entrepreneur, Donna Levin, who was going to be our keynote speaker at Iron Innovators Lecture Series the next day. I listened so carefully to the students as they spoke about why they came to Bay Path. So much of what I share with you this morning is really through their words and their wisdom, because I learned something about leadership every single day. And, and maybe that's part of our power as women. We love to share. So hopefully you'll pick up a few of the lessons of leadership that I heard and that reinforced for me the power of women and the empowerment of women. Here's one of the quotes that I felt summed up that conversation. And it's from one of my favorite writers and screenwriters, Nora Ephron, the late Nora Ephron, who ironically was a speaker at our Bay Path Women's Leadership Conference several years ago. And she said, above all else, be the heroine of your life, not the victim. And I heard about the activism through the voices of our students today. And what Nora Ephron is saying is take up your voice and be the leader. And what I saw in that room at that dinner that night with the women from age 18 to 49, they were accepting themselves as leaders. They were sharing their moment. And as I reflect, I realized that each and every one of them were determined to achieve their education at all costs, either to get the position they felt that they deserved or to learn something that they knew they needed for that next promotion or career move, or to make their children proud of them. One woman said that for two years she called the American Women's College, and she was 42 years old. She had five children, and she knew she needed an education to do what she wanted to do as a business entrepreneur. She kept putting off her education until one day her 13-year-old son said to her, Mom, 
practice what you preach. You have told us that education is the most powerful thing we could ever achieve in our lives, and yet for two years you've been putting off your own. She picked up the phone, she enrolled, and now she is at the American Women's College at 43 years of age with five children, a full-time job. I don't know how she does it. But she was there to make her children proud and to do something she had always wanted to do in her life. And our students, our 18-year-old students who were there, I could tell they had come to Bay Path to pursue a dream. And don't we all have dreams? Four times today I heard women and our students talk about the fact that over 50% of the students in America today are women at the baccalaureate, the masters, and now even at the doctoral level. So we are, women are the most educated group in our entire population. With that comes incredible responsibility. You have an education, you need to use it. And I think you've heard today from everybody that we have to act. We can't sit on the sidelines. And Lynn, I'm glad you told everybody what I say. When you have the chance to dance, get up and dance. That's action. That is to act. You cannot hold inside of you your dreams. You cannot hold inside of you when there is injustice in this world. You must act. So I love, I have loved every bit of my 25 years as president of Bay Path University. Wouldn't you, getting up every day and being surrounded by incredible women like the faculty members, Yadi and Gina that you heard from today and Janine, when you can see the students right before you growing and maturing and leading and learning as empowered women learners and leaders, I have been blessed for 25 years. But I learned another thing from the students at the dinner. One of them said, we should lead from where we are. And I thought back to all the years when I talked about the fact that we do not have to be CEOs to be leaders. We lead from where we are. And that means mentoring a child at Girls Inc. and changing that child's life forever. That means getting involved in politics at an early age as a student and really campaigning for somebody that you believe in, that somebody has the social justice voice that you know in 10 years you will have as a legislator. So know that we should lead from where we are. We do not have to have the title of CEO. And I heard that from one of our students. And finally, I have to share with you that when I think about leaders today, I think of one word I pray that we all will use, authenticity. We have to be authentic leaders. And what does that mean to me? It means to me that you lead not only from what you know in your mind, but you lead from your heart. It is so crucial to listen to the inner voice because it's the inner voice that really is the social justice voice. And so when I talk to students about leadership styles, I say be yourself. If you are yourself, it will turn out absolutely right. It will turn out right for you and it will turn out right for those that you may lead one day. Read everything possible, right? Have data and research. But in the end, it truly is about, about authentic leadership and leading from the heart. So no, I am proud of every single one of our faculty and staff. I am proud of our students because they will be leading our country in the future. I have often said the first woman president of the United States is going to be a Bay Path alum. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's going to happen. So Janine, thank you, thank you so much for allowing me to share a few reflections as I begin and end my swan song year. And I'll end with this one quote. There is no attribution. 
the author is unknown. There is no force more powerful than a woman determined to rise. I so state my case. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this has been such a historic time. I know we're a little over time. I know some of the students and a couple of the faculty may have to head to shuttles. But I just want to, uh, it's OK. We, this is a final moment. But if you have to, we understand if you have to leave. And, and I just want to thank, and hopefully she'll have a closing reflection for us. <laughs> wow. But uh, Chris Barnett, who leads our wonderful division. And if, it, if you weren't there saying, OK, make it happen, it would not be here. So as a closing reflection, your thoughts? Wow, okay, talk about being on the spot. Yes. Um, I thank you so much, Janine, for um, beckoning for me to come up here and, and close this. Um, I am just genuinely so touched by how many of you have come here today. And as I was sitting there, I was reflecting on um, two lessons that I have learned from Janine and from Dr. Leary, uh, because they both have incredible gifts for getting to know people at the very much the most human level and spotting those sources of energy and then doing what we've done today, which is identifying those sources of energy and putting us all together in one room so that we can channel our energy in one particular um, direction. Um, so with that, uh, thank you so much for coming today. We are so touched and um, really truly, let's keep the momentum going, um, all of us together in one direction. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And as we close, the students, their baskets, Crystal, if you could bring forth those two baskets. Our students, who are also public relations students, uh, took to heart the fact that the museum will have a new exhibit coming up. The new exhibit is all about, and I know you're waiting, the history of candy. Yes. So um, the students have prepared a special little historical gift for you. Um, and so as you're leaving, and one thing we will ask is that if you could let us know, we may send out one of the survey things to let us know what you thought about this program. And also, as a really final note, Brooke, if you can come forward, um, there are two serious notes that we have to make today. How many of you know the name Phyllis Wheatley, the poet? Phyllis Wheatley, raise your hand high. A lot of people don't know, and we did not know this, but on this day, on October 18th, she won her freedom. So we just want to have you read the quote from Phyllis Wheatley, Brooke, our alum. So, in every human beast, God has implanted a principle, which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. Phyllis Wheatley. Give her a round of applause. And also, through the video, you learned about Lucy Stone. How many know of the role of Lucy Stone, Susan B. Anthony? Yes, extremo. A lot of people will not know, but today is the day that she did pass away, S some years ago. So I just want, just for the reference. But we want to say, in a quiet silence for her, thank you for your service. So thank you. And we also include, with all of this history going forward, please reach out to me. Our panels are not finished, the documentation is not finished, and we want to make sure it's inclusive. So please reach out to me with names, people, and over the next couple of months, we want to make it so. But now, enjoy and thank you. Have, I was going to say breakfast, food, meet us at the cafe, and enjoy the museums. Thank you, and thank you to the students. Thank you.